Gospel according to St. Luke, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Then Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of Gennesaret, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped on to the land, a man in the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, he had not lived in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of him. For many times it seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding. And the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herders saw what happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man for whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people the surrounding this country of the Gennesaret came and asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with Jesus, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Praise you. There's so much going on in this situation this morning with Jesus and his healing of the demon-possessed man. You have a Jew who crosses over the lake into the Gentile world. And not just any Jew, but a teacher, a rabbi, an important person. And not only does he get out of the boat and set foot on tainted soil, he comes in contact with a possessed man. And not only comes in contact with a possessed man, but brings about healing of this possessed man and faces down the legion of demons that seem to be entrapped within him or possessed over him. We get Jesus showing his power over the socio-economic and ethnic diversity of the time. We see Jesus' willingness to engage the little and the lost and the least and the broken and the dirty and the unwanted and the unclean. We see Jesus showing his power over the spirits, showing his place at the top of the created order that even the demons, even evil, recognize and bow down to the maker of heaven and earth. And we saw that, we see that one who's at the top of the created order also showed compassion. He had no reason to fulfill the request of the demons. As a matter of fact, he had no mandate to even give them voice. But he does. Now this is kind of a Jesus thing. I wouldn't have thought of this, but the neighbor of heaven and earth does. He allows them to go into the pigs. They figure they're going to forge about for a while and then become bacon for someone's breakfast. But no, the last the pigs go jumping off into the sea, drowned, and where did the demons go? Or they don't want to go. I thought about Jesus doing a little sleight of hand. I'm not going to cast you in the abyss. I'll the pigs do. I like that. That's what I like about Jesus. In all this, we see more clearly the power and might and freedom that this Jesus, that this Messiah, that this Word made flesh brings. We see in Him the breaking of chains. We see in Him the breaking of bondage. We see in Him the release of the captive. 
For the man who was bound by the demons, who was enslaved by evil and fear, who was isolated and alone, ostracized from his community, and the word of God came along and showed might and compassion. This is just an incredible display of glory and power, freedom and release, hope and future. This is everything that we would expect from a Savior. We would expect nothing less from the Word made flesh. And He is met with fear and alienation. He is met with confrontation and exile. Luke says that the people of Gennesaret asked him to leave. Mark says that the people of Gennesaret drove him out. Now there would be little doubt that this man's family and friends, even the whole city, would have wanted him to be free. If not for their own purposes. His freedom would be good for the whole. His community was suffering from his possession. And freedom comes in Jesus. Release from, arrives in a boat from Galilee. The power of God shows up and the people react with fear and drive Jesus away. Why on earth would these people trapped for so long by this legion of demons as they all were, why would they be so afraid? How could it be that freedom was so fearful? How could it be that release was so terrifying? It seems like an oxymoron, a double-binding message. But in fact, most people, when faced with freedom, <coughs> remain trapped by fear and bondage. Stay with me here, folks, because this is spiritually important. <coughs> And the ramifications can be life We as humans, we as humans in our nature are more apt to acquiesce to what we know rather than face the unknown. We like to be proficient in our thoughts and our actions. So we will always revert back to the known no matter how awful, painful, or self-destructive it might be because we know it. We have built patterns and structures and behaviors around it. And others in our lives have acted in accord to the narrative of it. Regardless of how much we may want freedom in our hearts or in our dreams, our reality is usually wrapped up in the bond. And so our thoughts and our actions lean in to the bottom. Freedom is too terrifying for us. So terrifying, in fact, that we keep going back to the bottom. That is what we see in today's story. The people are so afraid of what this new freedom can look like and what this Jesus can bring, that in their fear, they drive the freedom away to maintain the status quo. I mean, hey, all well and good. The guy's not breaking chains, and he's probably going to actually last one day in one outfit. Though I don't know, in our modern world, you know, one outfit a day is kind of small. But anyway, he's going to stay clothed, and he actually might live in the house for a while. But... They much probably would prefer him to stay in the tombs, to maintain the status quo, to keep things the way they were. But we do the same thing when we are faced with the freedom of Christ. I mean, let's break it down for a minute. Let's break it down. I, I want to throw out a few things that I hope and pray that we can all accept. If you don't agree with it, I don't want you to raise your hand because, well, that would be uncomfortable. So we can all accept in the base of our being, in our spiritual identity, that we have been set free in the waters of baptism. That the maker of heaven and earth, the one who has named us and claimed us, the one who has washed us in his precious blood, the one who has given us his holy life, has our back and has in fact opened 
opened up the keys to the kingdom of eternity to which we are all welcomed. We can all accept the fact that because of our baptism, our name is written on the book of life, and because it's written on the book of life, we get access to God's eternal glory. We can agree on that, right? We should be able to because it's the foundation of our faith. And that is the freedom to live a life according to God. And yet, and yet, in the freedom of the promise, we are trapped. We are trapped every day. We are enslaved by the opinions of others. We are enslaved by what they think or what they say. Scroll somebody's Facebook feed. We are trapped in the lie of busyness, where we have to do all things and rest is unacceptable. We are trapped in the idolization of things, stuff, work, worry, hurt, anger. We are enslaved by disappointment and comparison. We are entombed by beating others down to elevate ourselves. We as humans in our brokenness are more willing to see the fault in the other, the flaw in the plan, the shadow in the light. We are quick to judge, quick to cast hurtful words, slow to forgive, slow to advance, and slow to show grace. Now, and I think we probably all agree on that too. Now, if we've been set free by the Savior, if we have been given new life in baptism, then why in heaven's name would we revert back to such fear? Why would we live in such brokenness? Why would we spend our lives chasing things that rust or get eaten by moths? Why would we have our treasure that can never be taken away, sacrificed for that which is needed? Why would we give over riches for rags? Because of fear. Because the freedom that Jesus offers, the hope that comes when the chains are broken, are just too much for us to bear. What will life look like on the other side of chasing wealth or power or opinions? What would I do with myself if I didn't want to look perfect on Facebook? How? Will I live a life of freedom when I have been trapped for so long that the slavery feels comfortable? You know, you ask any addict that question, and they will tell you, as I do, that the greatest fear was how will I live without the thing? What will I do with myself once I am set free? The freedom that comes from Christ, the release, is a freedom to see all things differently, beginning with the self, beginning with the I. It is a reprioritization of one's nature to align oneself, not with the world or slavery or sin, but with God, and that can be terrifying. Because good Lord knows what's going to happen when you say, God, I am yours, take me. God's got a really good sense of humor. And God's going to say, okay, here we go. Freedom for God can be terrifying, but here's the good news. God's not afraid of the terrifying. God's not afraid of the doubt. God's not afraid of storms. God is not going to cast us off in our newfound freedom. God is going to continue to direct that freedom for a greater purpose. Jesus left the land of Gennesaret after freeing the demon-possessed man. But when Jesus breaks our chains, he doesn't leave us. When Jesus says, I have set you free, he doesn't say, good luck, I'm off to get some appetizers. Jesus says, I am with you in this newfound freedom. Because I have things for you to do. I have a world for you to change. But you cannot change it, trapped by your fear and your bondage. When Jesus comes and breaks our chains, it can be scary. But Jesus is in that. He is in the scary. He is in the freedom. 
He is the moving forward. It's legions that hang out the status quo. It's legions that hang out the fear. May your bondage be broken. May you know the God of freedom. And may you wrap your arms around that freedom and see where God takes you.